one of my biggest pieces of advice would be just being really clear on your why and yeah. keep and maybe write it down somewhere that if you ever do feel a bit lost you can go back and look at it and sort of remind yourself because when you are exhausted when you've had 10 no's in a row you've not made any money for a week you're going to want that why to pull you through the other side and if you don't really believe in it it won't Hey, and welcome to episode two of the Stills in Motion podcast. Uh, today, we're joined by Charlie and Jess from The Travel Project, who are travel bloggers and content creators from the UK that are all about this idea of achievable adventures and kind of inspiring others to make these achievable adventures. Now, more than ever, like we're realizing how important it is to be outside and to enjoy our nearby surroundings. And Charlie and Jess are really doing a great job of kind of encouraging and inspiring people to plan adventures closer to home. So today we kind of dive into the inception of the travel project, how it started and how they've turned it into their, now their business. We talk about why your message is so important and how to finding a clear message can really help you to create a business that you're proud of and motivated to work in. Um, there's a lot of valuable things in today's podcast and Charlie and Jess really sort of were very honest and gave us a lot of important advice. So. I hope you enjoy this this one and um, yeah, let us know what you think. Right, so thanks guys for so much for coming on the podcast. Like, It's lovely to finally actually chat with you both. Um, I feel like I've been following you guys on for a while now on Instagram, so it's nice to kind of put a face, put some faces to the name and have a proper chat. Yeah, thanks for having us, mate. It's a funny world, isn't it, when you, when you follow someone on Instagram and you can converse with them in the comments and the occasional DM and then... Finally, you meet them. I hope we're not disappointed. <laughs> we're probably, probably going to be disappointed. But you feel like you know people. Like I find it actually weird that this is the first time we've yeah. actually spoken. It's That's actually strange, it's one it? of the really nice things about Instagram, that as well, isn't it? You mm. can kind of you can make friends for it. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's <a> nice thing. <laughs> Even when you're locked down. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. No, it's definitely like the the nicest part of Instagram, I think, like the community side. Like, it's so nice to kind of meet like fellow people like you that have kind of got similar interests. And, yeah, totally. Yeah, and actually something. on that point, it, I found that kind of the niche that we we both sort of operate in or we all operate in is a really friendly part of the of the app. Um, and people are, seem to be, from my experience, and I don't know if you, if you agree, I'm really genuine and authentic and passionate and all of these words that perhaps yeah. most people don't associate with Instagram as it's this big global beast now and it's... it's, but it's that travel side, I think, is people are quite supportive, especially that outdoorsy travel. Yeah, yeah that's, mm. that's my point. And, and actually, that's nice. It's not a kind of sap on your kind of morale it's actually just nice and people are quite friendly mm. which is cool <laughs> so that's good yeah I, to I totally agree like there's definitely a really nice community um around kind of the stuff that you know both of us kind of share online um but yeah for, for those of you for those like who haven't heard of you guys before would you kind of be able to just introduce yourselves and kind of give me a little bit of like an elevator pitch about like what the travel project is and what it's all about sure do you want to go first yeah, sure. So the Travel Project, um, I guess it's a it's a Instagram blog um, that we started in 2016. At the moment, it's um, it's progressed to a point where we're all about achievable adventure. So we champion achievable adventure, and it's about making adventure and that sort of the benefits you get from being outdoors achievable to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's basically yeah. breaking down barriers, making it more accessible. I think from our personal journey, uh, or our journey from 2016, as Jess mentioned, we've gone through a lot uh, and realised that perhaps some of this content out there in the world of uh, Instagram and beyond is, is quite unattainable and quite unrealistic to ordinary people. Um, so it felt a bit exclusive to be continue to do all that kind of stuff. So we've learned that perhaps bringing a bit closer to home and championing places like the UK and, and, and that are accessible by um, car and not, not just by aeroplanes feels like a more sustainable model both on the environment but also for, in terms of people living a life that's built around adventure so um, yeah that's kind of what we do yeah, awesome yeah it's like I, th I think like the word like authentic like we kind of touched on it before kind of does get thrown around like quite a lot on Instagram but like when I when I see like the stuff you guys are sharing online, I do like honestly feel like it's so genuine. It feels it feel like even though we've never met, it feels very like you and that like, you're sharing like your you know your like kernel of truth like 
on the internet. And I think that really resonates with me. And I think it definitely resonates with your audience. Like this idea that adventure is for everyone and that, you know, you just, you can just go find it anywhere. Um, That's really cool to hear. I, I think we were talking about this earlier and it is, that's our kind of core mission and our message, if you like. That's our why, reason to exist um, from a marketing spiel perspective. But the, the reality is we're constantly trying to find a way of, of communicating that in a really organic fashion. Um, again, organic to the word, like authentic, yeah. it's overused. But uh, it's good, cool that you picked up on that. But we were talking about earlier, we, we, you know, still, I, I don't know how you feel, mate, but I feel like I've got so far to go from a kind of, we, we want to keep making it more accessible, keep, um, sort of showcasing our experiences in more real light and playing around with that. So, um, yeah, it's a, I guess it's a journey and we're yeah. not quite yet at the destination. No, it constantly changes and constantly progresses, which I think with everyone it does. And I think we've been on quite a journey. Ours sort of starts in a completely different place and to where we've ended up. But it's, hmm. yeah, it's quite exciting and it's something that I think we feel quite strongly about. So it makes it, keeps it fun, I suppose. And it's actually been the times yeah. we've, gone away from what we really care about that we've started to lose sort of love with fall out of love with it a bit yeah so it's, um, yeah. yeah it's it's been an interesting journey so far yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah um, it would be great to kind of like go back right to the start of like the travel project and kind of like if you can tell me you know what life kind of looks like for you both in 2016 and what sort of made you decide to kind of pack that all in and sort of start this start this project yeah good question i'll, I'll start, you start yeah. so like essentially or rather we were both working in agencies advertising agencies in london separate separate agencies jess in soho i was over in shoreditch um and as a few people will tell you i imagine you work in the industry um sorry i've just had a um work in the industry essentially it gets quite monotonous and you get you, you lose a little bit of your love when you do um advert after advert after advert and they're all the same so i think we, we reached a point collectively where we're like let we need, want to escape we want to get out of here we want to do something different um and the conversation in the evening was we want to do that but we don't want to just go and get drunk on a beach with a load of kind of um you know western travelers in thailand for example um mainly because we've done that before uh, but, but also because we were at that age, it was the last year of our 30s at that point. 20s. 30s. <laughs> uh, 20s at that point. And we didn't want to kind of, we wanted something different that was going to really excite us. Um, so we came up with this idea. This was when Instagram was starting to kind of kick off properly, if that makes sense. Or maybe just before it was bubbling. Um, and we um, came up with this idea. We were like, right, well, let's not have any plan at all other than to use Instagram as a guidebook. So no guidebooks, no travel apps. We're just gonna to go to a city. We're gonna contact a load of people on Instagram. And because they're local, in theory, they will have an insight into that place that will steer our experience um, and give us a, a, um, a journey that was completely original and really personal and totally different. So that was the idea, which kind of sounded cool. Um, so we decided yeah. to do that, basically. Yeah, so as Charlie said, it was basically just seeing the world through, I guess, the lens of all the locals who lived there and actually had that experience of meeting people totally different, different to us and just doing something really different. So we spent so many years, gone straight from uni to working in London for a load of years and it just got to that point in life where we wanted something different and it felt like a really... I mean, we weren't at the time photographers or anything like that. It just seemed like a nice, a fun way to use the platform to connect with people interesting people and it was great to i guess document it to keep our memories as well um yeah so essentially we flew out to india um delhi on a one-way ticket uh, in september 2016 um and to, much to our surprise we were welcomed into people's homes from day one pretty much and this yeah. kind of mad experience kicked off where our our journey was completely guided by people across india all these locals um and then it yeah, for the next year we, we spent travelling around the world um, like that and it was, looking back on it, a completely mad thing to do. Met because... some really interesting people and yeah, the friendliness of people I think was one of the most surprising things. I think in the first week, first day we got there we met one guy who introduced us to his friend who was a chef who whipped up a, 
this amazing Parsi meal for us and then we got invited to stay with someone for a week and that was all in what the first few days we were like yeah. wow yeah. But and we didn't really look back and it was this amazing thing that we realised Instagram was this global tool that gave us access to all these local um, communities people um, and experiences um, and so yeah we just kind of built on that and, and we, we got a bit of press early on um, just because it was a new idea um, and that allowed us to grow a little bit of a community and a following uh, and, and as soon as we got to a certain point with our Instagram following, we, we, um, it kind of became apparent to us that perhaps we could turn this into some sort of job, which was at that point like the dream. I was just like, brilliant, this is great. Because that wasn't our intention, but about halfway through it, it started to become apparent that, that was a possibility. It's when you start getting offered things for free or being paid to do little bits and bobs. It yeah. was quite, it's quite a strange change for us, I suppose, because at first it had just been a passion project and then you start to... And I think that's actually been a bit of a confusing time for us as well. And I don't know if it's the same for you, where you you go from just doing it as your passion as to all of a sudden it's something that... It's a business. A business, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. that's been quite, quite an interesting journey for us, really. Yeah, I remember being in um, Johannesburg about halfway through our trip and we got 10,000, like it went from 9999 to 10K. And it was almost like overnight we started getting offers for stuff. And that was weird. Because that you can almost pinpoint that or, or draw a line in the sand as that's when it became... Um, a viable source of income of, of sorts or, or, or revenue stream anyway um, and yeah so <laughs> it was a mad year 2016 it really was it delivered on what we would hoped it would which was just to, to give us something that we'd never forget and um, yeah connect us with people that we would remain friends with and we, and we still do to this day yeah, that's amazing so I guess like in 2016 like Instagram was I don't even know how old it was at that point but I think I suppose, six years by then but yeah it wasn't big time at that point yeah I guess like community was still kind of like well still like a big big part of it but I mean at that point were were people kind of doing what you guys were doing or was it like did people kind of think you're a bit mad to sort of go off and have your travels dictated by this app yeah i mean it, it, we we kind of sold it if you like as the world first because i think it was the first time people had ever done it and vis-a-vis -vis half people thought awesome that's what a great idea and half people thought that is ridiculous you're <laughs> idiots um and i and i think both were right in some some respects because it was it was stressful um but ultimately it was it was incredible uh, but but it was it was in its infancy in terms of mainstream media at that point um instagram so it was um yeah it was original people hadn't heard of it before but it's a funny platform instagram isn't it because we always say had we done something like that with facebook i would be really sort of kind of creeped out if someone contacting me on Facebook saying do you want to meet <laughs> yeah but on Instagram it didn't feel like that I think it's you find people who you have something in common with and it's the creative community yeah, yeah so there's there's something it, it just worked with that platform which was quite interesting yeah I guess there's like this common ground isn't there that like you just look at someone's feed and they're like oh okay they're probably they're like me they're doing the same sort of things and like they obviously like the things they look interesting and I think it, it it's sort of it's that's your opener isn't it we, we said um, we said i think we referred to it as a shop window um back in the early days because you you, you know you can have a good sense of what's going to be inside or what the person's going to be like um once you have a look at their instagram page you know often that is anyway so you know we found that we could get to know someone's character quite well um, just by checking out their Instagram and seeing what they were into, you know, and we'd go and meet an artist in Udo Paul, for example, and you could really see he was really into a specific type of art and the way he interacted with the city was dictated by that and we we're like, yes, we want to go and do that, so you'd reach out to him or that, you know, that's the way it worked and that was actually far better than any guidebook because you, if you, someone comes to London and they go, all right, I'm going to get the guidebook out, they're going to end up at the Tower of London um, Buckingham Oxford Palace, Street. Oxford Street, yeah. and they're going to have experience A. But if they come and they contact us or, or someone else in the creative community via Instagram and they dictate their experience, they're going to end up, you know, at, at the little market that is kind of off the main street buying kind of the best baked goods or they're going to be involved in like some sort of subculture scene um, on the west of the city, the east of the city, and that's experience B. And it's totally two different cities, really. Yeah, I mean, I think especially places like Delhi is a good example where we started, but people have told us, get out of Delhi as soon as you can. It's, yeah. Don't stay there. And 
However, I think our experience is totally different. We met so many cool people in Delhi and saw it all from these different locals' perspectives that I would 100 percent tell someone to go to Delhi. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, just so, believe the yeah. surface, basically. Yeah, no, it was awesome. It was awesome. Yeah, no, that's really cool. So you said kind of like around sort of 10,000 followers sort of things started to come in. Like what what did that kind of look like at the time and what sort of things were coming in and how did you kind of think about those sort of things as they, as they did? It's such a funny question really because at that time, the sort of stuff, I mean, now we get offered some bizarre things, but <laughs> at least now we we are kind of, evolved enough and mature enough in our brand for people to so there be some sort of filter you know back then we were getting offered all sorts of products like you know like uh, hair pro- you know like shampoos and all this kind of stuff it's like why are you offering us this like and i think at that point in the influencer marketing space it was super um, yeah. immature as well so like everyone was doing this weird it's a free for all wasn't it like the wild west you always called it yeah it was the wild that. west back then yeah and so we were getting offered you know, all this crap, basically. But uh, the, the stuff of substance was, I think we got first, Hotels. our first stay was a hotel, like in a sustainable hotel in in um, Limpopo, which is in the in the very north of mm. South Africa. Um, and I remember thinking at the time, this is so cool. And we did sort of visit Cape Town, I think, as well. So Yeah, that was it. Yeah. And I think that's, as you're saying as well, when you, nowadays, you get some really good projects in and then there's a load of random stuff that you just know to you know the person hasn't even looked into it properly to have sent it to you in the first place so you just kind of whatever. someone called me Alan on an email <laughs> <laughs> they were like it was obviously one of those placeholders he'd forgotten to he copied and pasted it the other <laughs> shot it. so he's like hi Alan I was like, he did actually send a follow up email being like I'm so embarrassed <laughs> yeah anyway sorry um, but yeah I suppose what I was saying is at that point we'd never expected to make any money out of this. It was just a little project for ourselves. So it's kind of, you get already excited as well. You almost don't want to say no to anything. And we actually, in fairness, have been, we haven't really taken anything we don't sort of believe in, but it was tempting. It was a bit like, what do you do? We've just been offered a hair turban. I mean, like for drying your hair, <laughs> we were like, do we take it? <laughs> yeah. And we didn't, but it's, um, yeah, it was a it was quite a funny stage at that point because it was just so different for us. And yeah, and I also think now that the um, information available online, where you can read about other people's experiences and, and hopefully in, you know little pieces of content like this will help inform other people in the space. But back then it wasn't like we call it the Wild West because there wasn't any rules, there wasn't any like playbook for how you should act in these scenarios. Um, so yeah, it was just about kind of trying to figure it out and stumble our way through the experience, trying to have fun uh, first and foremost but also at the same time starting to begin to realize perhaps there was a business in this um, and actually that process was was looking back on it it was years long mm. before we realized actually how to build a sustainable business model out of this following that we'd got um, and, and that's been probably the hardest part of this entire journey is <laughs> figuring that out mm. um, so yeah it's been it's been uh, full of mistakes, lessons, learnings, and, you know, everything in between. So I guess, like, what you kind of touched on there is, like, you know, turning your, this thing you were just doing for fun and your passion into, like, something that was going to be, like, a job or a business. <clears throat> and that's kind of, like, basically what this podcast is about. So I'd love to kind of dive in a little bit more um, on that. And kind of, so you started having these, like, emails come through of, like, things that you, you know, could or couldn't promote. And, um like what what was kind of like your thought process at that stage were you like did you think oh this could be a really like useful business thing or were you like oh this is just like a nice thing to have to our you know to make us have a free stay like were you kind of aware that this could lead to something at, like from from that point um what, what, yeah go for it I think, yeah, well, at least from my perspective, I thought initially it was a really great um, addition to our travels. And I think we were like, this is cool. This is something that can help us travel for longer because it was something we weren't going to be able to sustain financially, but financially yeah. for that long. And it, it, yeah, it seemed quite exciting. I think we didn't, when we got back from our first trip, I went back to freelancing. I think you did as well. Um, so it was something we wanted to keep going in the background and we saw I think we always saw it as a bit of a side business and it was only it took a while for us to realize that actually it's something and you at one point we both decided to take a bit of a leap 
but probably before it was fully established to actually get it to a, into a place where we could take it into a full business. But um, coming back, I mean, something that's quite interesting for us was coming back and finishing that first project was also a bit confusing for us because it wasn't a project we could really continue at home. And so it was something we were trying to work out. So we tried to keep going with it at home, but it was a bit confusing. So, and I think we got taken in a bit by Instagram then in terms of, trying to post things that Instagram wanted. Yeah. Um, and we saw, a, you get this sample earlier, someone, on, a girl on a dress in some sand jeans gets loads of likes on Instagram and all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, it's a platform I can make money out of. Maybe I need to be posting that as well. And yeah. to be totally honest, we got quite lost in the middle stage. I think the beginning of our project was really strong and really exciting for us. And we weren't photographers or videographers at that stage, but we loved the content we were creating because it was just so genuine and... Having, and then the middle ground we did we actually worked a lot with it started to pick up interestingly with a lot of um, branded trips and that kind of thing so we got offered quite a lot of them and we just sort of said yes to them all if they sounded cool sort of going to Norway or going to Morocco it sounded brilliant but these sort of press trips where you're with lots of other Instagrams who weren't sort of necessarily that similar to us it wasn't necessarily these sort of outdoor adventure people um it started to just, we got a bit lost and it was only more recently, I'd probably say kind of end of last year, beginning of this year, that we really were like, realised that the main thing we took away from the first trip was this amazing ability to get away from, what it gave to us was this, just taking a step back from life here and having, going on adventure and what that actually made us feel, something we wanted to sustain, but financially it wasn't viable for us to just keep going and creating all this you know, jumping on flights constantly. And for the world, it wasn't really that sustainable either. You don't want to, we're not saying don't fly at all, but we're trying to keep it now down to a couple of times a year for bigger trips and then still have adventure in your life, but mm. in, a, in a more regular fashion. And it also felt a bit weird to be telling people, you know, live this life all around the world where it's, for most people, it's not feasible. So that's something that's, as our projects changed, it's been, I think we've enjoyed a lot of our work through it this year a lot more because yeah. we've been very focused on that and it's something we really, really believe in. So um, I kind of sort of don't know where I've gone with this. <laughs> yeah, I think in answer to your question, essentially building the business was, wasn't an overnight thing where we realised, okay, this is the formula. I think as Jess has touched on there, we got very distracted in the middle part by getting paid a, a bit of money to go somewhere really cool. Um, so someone says to you, we're going to pay you to go to Costa Rica. And, and like, in lot, not many people are going to go, no, I'm not going to do that. Because it's just like this amazing opportunity and, you know, you're, you've got this appetite for travel that, that I think we all share, which is to, to some extent insatiable. Um, and we did those, but they weren't actually, it wasn't actually sustainable to be doing that because the amount of time you had to take out of your schedule to do it, you weren't getting paid enough. Um, and I think actually what happened is lockdown has really changed our um, our approach because we've realised that doing UK focused adventures not only far more inclusive is far more sustainable as us for a business model uh, from standpoint because we're not away the whole time we're actually can do two three days adventures and also it's more sustainable from an environmental standpoint again as Jess has touched on um, so perhaps our business has only become completely um, sensible in terms from an economic standpoint maybe. February this year. Um, mm, and it's been quite recent, around. really. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's, that's quite an honest answer, really. There was a lot of that middle period that was, um, yeah, just trying to figure it out and like learning to say no, basically, I think is probably the best <laughs> point I can make there. But I think February this year was also the time that both of us took the leap to do it full time. And I do think there's some people do a very good job of doing their job and doing sort of a side their side hustle I suppose and doing it really well and I think for us it just took that to take our focus away from other work and put it all into this has really actually helped us but it's a sort of a scary leap for and we had built it to a, a point where we knew we could sort of live off the money we were getting even though it would be sort of basically <laughs> yeah but um but that's actually really helped propel it as well I think because it's allowed us to really focus on what what it is we care about and what we want to be doing yeah there's a long yeah. answer for you. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was a great answer. Like, I, think, I think that's really interesting that you touch on that. Like, I feel like often at the beginning of a kind of like creative endeavor or like a business or something, you, you have this sort of need to sort of, you know, 
pay the bills and like get some money and go travel to these cool places. And I think it's very easy to say yes to those things and then sort of lose track of what your your motivation was in the first place. And I feel like for you guys, that's kind of, that's been it. Like you've had your, you had your, your message and your motivation and then you kind of, you know, were able to be paid for these cool things. And then now you've kind of like refound what it is that drives you. And I feel like having, having that message, that core message of what it is you do and why you do it is like such a motivational thing for like yourselves and for everyone else watching like to keep going and to like to know where you're where you're heading sort of thing yeah and i think from from a creative business standpoint for anyone listening it's i think one of the key takeaways there is that in the middle period of our of our travel project lifespan today we were we were um not people weren't relating as much as well so once you kind of rediscover your why and you have that mission not only are you happier that comes across and people buy into it more um and i think from if you're trying to buy build a business you know it's uh, it's not exactly pioneering for me to tell you that that brand is absolutely key you know so i think we've this year been just building rebuilding our brand and repositioning it slightly to be more in tune with like what we're now passionate about and i think that's um hopefully going to work from a from financial business standpoint but but also we're finding people relate to it a lot more um which is kind of it's a double win essentially yeah, yeah, I think having that having that passion and sort of staying true to that just makes it so much easier to keep going when you get those hard times because anyone starting a business, you hit some really hard times and it's not mm. all plain sailing. And I think it's really tricky to stay motivated if you've also lost your way in terms of why you're doing it. But yeah. if you, you really believe in why, it somehow is much easier and you just keep, you put in all those hours still and it doesn't seem to yeah. feel as much of an effort. People bang on in marketing about in North Star, don't they? And I think that's a little bit cliche, it's pretty, pretty good to have that in your mind, you know, where are we, what's our compass, where are we heading, where do we want to go? Um, and so when you do get lost, as Jess said, you've got, you've got something to focus on and it, and, it, and it ultimately might be a tricky week, but the next week you'll be back on track again far quicker than if you've, if you've kind of um, lost touch with your motivations, I would suggest. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's really, really good. Um, so I guess when it comes to kind of like working and partnering with brands for some of like your trips, like what has been some of your sort of like major lessons with that? And what kind of advice would you give to others who want to start to integrate more brands into their sort of social content? Uh, oh, great question. I think well, a good place to start perhaps is with your media pack. That's quite a kind of basic thing, I suppose, in some ways. But um, for those who don't know what a media pack is, it's essentially a kind of uh, list of your credentials and a, and a portfolio of sorts for the work that you'll produce for the prospective um, brand. Um, get that good and tight and looking brilliant and really representing all your messages that you, you offer as a brand and the styles and, and all the numbers and stuff. And then I think... From us, the most important thing that we've brought perhaps from an agency background is to be selective with who we approach and how we approach them. You know, back to this, me being called Alan the other day, it's, it's, it's being um, blanket emailed by a brand is so impersonal. In a world that's digital, if you get those things, you don't want to hear about it. And I think the same is true in reverse. So be personal and be focused and be... Um, thoughtful about the brands that you think are right for you a from a passion standpoint and b from a brand standpoint those two things should probably marry up anyway um and then think about how you're going to get hold of them and what you want to do with them you know so you don't just go we try not to just go hey we want to work with you we try and go hey we've got some we love what you do this is why we think we could be a good fit um and here are a couple of ideas if you're interested um and that's been quite successful I'd say. Yeah and I think the great thing about social media these days is you can start to build those relationships slowly and across a, a number of brands quite easily so just talking to them on social seeing what they're up to building that relationship which I think sort of and then it, you can find a good time to either contact them or they've got you front of mind when they they know what you do and they like what you do and you have a bit of a dialogue going that when something comes up you're in their sort of top Thoughts. of mind. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and I think another, I suppose another bit of advice that we could take from our um, agency's days is keeping it 
just getting a few of the formalities in line as well. So the, I mean, one thing, always under promise and over deliver on everything. Be really clear, just with contracts and stuff. You don't need to get bogged down with it's super serious or anything, but just having these sort of things in place and just being really clear in terms of outlining what you're going to do and what they want from you. I think you can yeah. avoid a lot of issues there. Later down the line. Yeah. And actually it's interesting because if I was doing this by myself, which by the way, it wouldn't work at all because I, I'm not good enough to do it by myself. And, but but if um, I was doing it by myself, I would have missed so many stipulations and contracts that would have landed me in hot water. You know, and you get sent these contracts and I look at them and I'm like, oh my God, what? five pages of stipulations I'm not reading that um, and then Jess reads through she's like oh, well you need to look at that because they're making us you know there's some sort of exclusivity clause or whatever it may be and it's just things like that where it's kind of like oh wait we are actually adults and this is actually a proper business you know and, and thinking about it with your big boy pants on to use that um, American <laughs> phrase now. Um, and, and just yeah just kind of trying to be um and I think that attitude of, of the big boy pants, if you like, it, 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 it translates across into how you value yourself as well. Like when you're pitching and you're putting a price on your work, you have to stop. We, I had to, let's, let's, from a personal perspective, had to take away this notion that I should be so lucky to be getting free product or I should be so lucky to be staying somewhere for free. Because actually, from an agency perspective, I know how much we used to charge people to create content for them, you know. And it well, how was, much we used to pay photographers and yeah, stuff. And, and actually, stuff. yeah, all these content creators are people who are experts in creating content for that space. So it's Yeah, and it's, that's really important. You know, I, and I actually used, got a bit bored of hearing people saying, you must value your work because everyone said it. But I realised, actually, the reason why everyone says it is because it's probably one of the most important things you can you can say, and it's one of the most important things to think about, is, is, is value your work um, and, and know when to say that's not enough. Know what your line is as well. I think it's that mid middle ground, which I'm sure you have all the time. It's trying to, you've got to value yourself, but maybe not overvalue yourself, but also know where you're, what is your absolute sort of minimum for something and your sort of non-negotiables and be willing to say no. Mm if they don't hit that and you can't be unrealistic of course and sometimes you need to do something we've said yes to things that maybe you don't get much money at all for but it's great for our portfolio or we're doing something really cool that would otherwise never be able to do and it's and then balancing those when you do the jobs that it's a bit more for the money they're less exciting and it's sort of balancing it all but I think it's just valuing yourself and yeah having that line and quite interestingly we've had a couple of times recently where They've said, we, well, we don't have that money. Mm. and Or they're like, can we just do something like this? And we're like, well, that's not right for our channel, so no. So we're going to do it like this. And then they say, okay, well, we can't do it this time. And then they come back a week later saying, actually, we're really keen to do it. And I think mm. sometimes, and that's something we've learned over the years as well, is there's no benefit to anyone putting something on, creating something that, and putting it on your channels that is not right for you. And it only, even if you get money for that job in the long run, it's not going to help. It's very different if you're shooting something for the client's channels only, which we sometimes do. And then, of course, if your name's not going to be on it, you can just give them what, exactly what they want. You just want to have probably a quality of work that you don't want going out only below a certain level. But, yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I, I Yeah, I wish I had more access to, to other kind of content creators experiences as we were coming through because like I said it was very new then um, so yeah I've been asked a few times recently what our advice is but I think that covers it quite nicely is I guess in summary kind of be professional and absorb as much experience as you can you know listen to podcasts like this um, there's great content on YouTube actually around kind of advice led um, read books you know like that's an obvious one um, but I've read a lot of good books recently that have helped inform the business um, and just be a sponge and willing to kind of um, not not be too stuck in your ways and, and listen basically I think that's quite crucial but I'd be yeah, interested that, what's your that's experience been <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting, like, the things you're saying, I feel like I resonate with so much. Like, there's the kind of things that I've gone through, like, as well. And I think, as I'm sure there's a lot of people listening that have gone through the same same sort of things. Like, you know, trying to find this balance between, like, oh, there's all these exciting projects being offered to me, but knowing whether they are right for you. And then also knowing, 
what that va- what the value of that project is not just for you but for the client and trying to trying to kind of figure that all out so I, that was a really great answer and thanks for that yeah and i also um, think just to further on that i think we're currently experiencing like, again be interesting to get your standpoint that there's this um, increasing divide between your value as a media channel i.e your community and your reach and your engagement and all that jazz and your value as a photographer or a content creator and then what that those two values look like when you when you add them together if that makes sense mm-hmm. so because we're increasingly getting um, asked them actually make a lot of our money off creating content for brands that we won't put on our channels um so that's a shift that we're experiencing are you are you feeling are you getting more and more projects come through along those lines i I guess like that's a really interesting like point and something i talk i've spoken to a few of my friends about like this idea of you're, you know, you're creating work for the brand that you're going to share on your profile, but they're also, you, they also might be buying that to use on theirs. And if that value of the products being used on theirs is set by your following, not the quality of your work, that's the bit that I think is very, like, I'm going to say, like, unfair. Yeah, really. yeah, exactly. Like, um, and I think that's that's an interesting balance. And like, I guess from my from sort of the way my, maybe my experience differs from yours is like I I came from a photography standpoint first and then like my social media has kind of built from from sharing photos so originally like well I mean it's not like I've been doing it for very long but originally like my photography it was all the way I would monetize that was through like day rates and image licensing and then as things progressed on Instagram it used then it started to become like a social content as well so they're kind of like two separate streams but almost now they're kind of coming close together and there's this sort of mix of a brand might want to buy, want to pay me to be do their photos or film or whatever, but they also want me to share it. And that's, I think, kind of, if it, pr- learning how to price those things yeah. and to give the value, like how much value that's worth is is difficult. And it's even more difficult when the value is set by the client already and they've decided that because of your following, your photos are worth this much. Exactly, Yeah. exactly. And, and, and you know, to, to make an extreme case in point, like there are some really big content creators out there who have incredible reach, no doubt. Who stuff's crap? I just, do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to sort of be around so the bush. In, so their, their pictures aren't going to be used by the brand probably anywhere else. And you get and actually, and on the other side of things, you get some people with one thousand, two thousand. You look at their stuff and you're like, wow, this. Well, they're professional. This one, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Then maybe, but maybe they're actually just kids who are getting say kids like they're new new on the scene and they and they're just good at it you know i yeah. keep seeing these people like with like i say like it's one thousand two thousand doesn't even matter what number it is and they're great i'm like wow this person like people should be paying for that person's work um, and i think it's a transitional phase actually and we are right this moment as we record this in the middle of it so like there's no precedent there's no playbook it's evolving and like i guess in some ways we're all making the rules i think brands are brands are becoming i think more switched on to it we had brand talking the other day about how they're using people who are sort of with 1000 2000 followers but really good content creators and actually more using them as content creators rather than for their reach and then paying paid media so spending to get the reach and so, then yeah i mean that's quite when which is interesting about. but i don't know at that point how much are they then paying those people because it might be that's why i feel people do have to value themselves like value their, the work they do because mm. there's a chance they're like great we'll count them as like you've only got 2000 followers so we'll only pay you this mm. whereas actually their work is fantastic and they're using them basically instead of photographers so yeah yeah and working in an agency i know how much we used to spend we do a photography shoot you might spend 30 grand for a day and don't get me wrong that's like big big yeah. big scale and you got but you you know what i mean you look at the comparisons and you're like wow it's um so it's just i think everyone's trying to find their their way but i think it's important for not even on a, just an individual level, but on an industry level for everyone to value their work. Otherwise, everybody else's gets un- devalued. Un- devalued yeah, as yeah well. exactly. Absolutely. I think this is like a very poignant uh, subject at the moment because like, I, the, uh, I had um, Derek Malou on the first podcast and we spoke, we spoke about the same, same thing, like this, con- this sort of difficult link. And um, I think, Jess, what you kind of said there about like these sort of smaller content creators kind of being hired as photographers instead that's 
in a way kind of like how my business started um like i was reached reached out by a couple of big brands and i didn't really have a big following but they found me as a photographer through instagram and they were kind of they weren't buying me for my reach but they were buying me for the work i was producing but it was through this social platform so i think it's kind of like a different way of being a photographer and making that work yeah um yeah no, that, that's so interesting isn't it it's almost back to what i said earlier about the shop window but from a more commercialized standpoint so brands are essentially scouting talent via the app um which makes absolute total sense and it's something that um yeah from my agency days we did a bit of as well you know it's a great way of getting them but if you're then found that way then you've got a kind of that they see you through an Instagram lens, so they look at the number as well. Even if they say they're not, they're looking at the number. So that's kind of affecting their evaluation. But perhaps we are in a somewhat of a pivotal transitional moment where, um, you know, we the value will be realised by brands because I think brands know they're getting a good deal. There's no two ways about it. Well, people, that. almost everyone's on Instagram now with their creative as a marketing, it might not be where they started, but it's a marketing platform. So as you say, you might have been a photographer for years. There's lots of photographers who were around way before Instagram started who now share their stuff on Instagram. So I think it is, it's turning into a bit of a, the platform's always changing how people are using it. So I think people are becoming aware, but I think it's just about, yeah, as you say, knowing your worth and sort of standing your ground to a certain extent on things. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think I'd, I'd be really interested to hear like how it is like working together on the travel project and how, <laughs> that's probably an obvious question but <laughs> no, that, um, yeah oh mate well I don't are we, are we not swearing on this podcast I assume it's a nightmare no, <laughs> mate, we swore on Instagram the other day um side side anecdote and we got in big trouble um and and it's been really done us over actually but we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit I mean, it's a very minor swear word as well but um yeah, yeah the instagram overlords were not happy so i won't swear on this oh. um it is a mixture of the best thing ever and one of the biggest challenges ever um working together living together being together mm. um and actually it's something that we are now locked down together as well. <laughs> so it's the dream the quadruple um no i think uh, uh, from my standpoint i feel like there was a lot of um well, teething issues for one of a better term in the middle years, especially when we didn't quite know what we were doing. It was really tough and learning a lot about one another and how each other liked to work. And then I think, you know, over time we've figured it out a lot better and we've realised when to give each other space. We've realised where each other's real strengths lie and I think that's quite key. And also perhaps weaknesses as well in, yeah. in, in my <laughs> no, case, for example, in both ways. Um, and it's not for everyone. Um, I don't think. I think probably most people who hear us talk like this go, um, I can never do that. Uh, my, most of our friends yeah. are, I can never ever do that. And I would definitely be in the I, I can never, never do that. I never thought we could, it just sort of happened. It was never really the plan, as I said, for this to sort of end up being our job sort of full time. Yeah, so it it's, happened, um, yeah. but yeah, it's, you get ups. I think with every, everyone's job, you get those ups and downs. And the, the hardest thing is not being able to go home and get away from it. Yeah. So I think where we've, what we've actually become quite good at is understanding when you're having an argument about work and when you're actually having a more relationship-based argument. And actually on the whole, we don't really fight unless it's about work disagreements. So at yeah. least you can put a bit of a like, take the emotion it. out of it and just be, sort mm -hmm. of agree to disagree on something. I think the most so. important ingredient for me is that we both love it. Mm. And if we didn't both love it, it wouldn't work. Um, you know, why we started is because we, we both wanted to have an experience out in the big wide world that was so mad and wild and so pushed us so far out of our comfort zones that we were in awe of how different it was. Um, and I think that's that kind of core ingredient has remained a constant throughout the experience. Um, you know, and now, you know, I, I'm, I'm in no doubt, in fact, I've seen it, you get up at mad times in the night to get a sunrise, mm -hmm. you, you camp out in something ridiculously cold, you know, you go through all those experiences that aren't for a lot of people, actually, and I totally understand that, you know, people in their free time, they want to go and lie on a beach somewhere, but we're both people who want to get back from an adventure and be like, wow, that was cool. And I think we buzz off that to the extent that like, everything else falls by the wayside yeah. of it, like at the end of the day, basically. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, 
I think maybe we'll wrap up just as we're probably getting to about an hour now. But this has been really, really great conversation. Um, but just kind of to finish off, um, like just if you guys could give a bit of like a few sort of words of wisdom for those kind of like starting out and looking to turn their kind of passion into a business. It'd be great to hear. Yeah, I think, well, the first one, I think really learning from our own, I guess, um, wins and mistakes is find something you're passionate about and really sort of, and your, your why, your, the reason why you're doing it and stick to it. Because we felt things have always gone well for us when we've been very clear about that. And it's only the times we've lost that, that we've, we've sort of, I guess, fallen out of love with the project or lost um, energy for it. And, it. and actually the reaction to it has not been as good as well. So I think one of my biggest pieces of advice would be just being really clear on your why. And yeah. keep, and maybe write it down somewhere that if you ever do feel a bit lost, you can go back and look at it and sort of remind yourself. Because I think, yeah, that's the most important thing. Yeah, for us. and that why obviously almost goes without saying has to be something that you really care about and are really passionate mm -hmm. about. Because when you are exhausted, when you've had 10 no's in a row, um, you've not made any money for a week, you're going to want that why to pull you through the other side. And if you don't really believe in it, it won't. Um, and I think Jess's point there, maybe write a manifesto, maybe it's just a one pager. It's just like, this is why I'm doing it. Um, and this is why, where I want to be, you know, your North Star or whatever you want to call it. No one even needs to see it, so you don't even need it to be kind Public, of perfect, yeah. but it's just something for yourself, I think. Yeah, and then on top of that, I would say if you, if you wanted to do something along our lines, is invest in kit. Um, it's something, again, we learn stupidly slowly. We've only just got proper stuff, really. Yeah, so we got our, we were using a really rubbish, because we didn't start as photographers like you, like you did, we, we started, we just bought a quite a cheap camera really and didn't really feel like it was we deserved anything better than that because we didn't know how to use one and we had so i had serious imposter syndrome actually for ages around photography i was like all these people have spent so many years studying this art form and craft who am i to come along and say i'm a photographer and i felt like i had to earn my stripes but potentially push that philosophy a bit too far and should have gone should have got a proper camera early so i would say yeah investment kit and then my final point would be like um, talk to as many people as you can read as much stuff as you can yeah. if you really love it and you want to make it work just just in your spare time read up um, go out use your kit just like live and breathe it because it will your craft will get you'll get better at it you'll um, you'll get better kind of storytelling abilities you'll get better technically um, and yeah I just just you need to put the time in basically yeah no, brilliant. Thanks so much again for coming on, uh, guys. Like That was a really valuable like conversation, so thanks so much. Yeah, we That's enjoyed it. Show. I mean, we waffled. We do waffle. So. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we get us both answering the same thing. Yeah, and also we're in lockdown, <laughs> so we haven't spoken to anyone else. So we're like, <laughs> <laughs> I hope no, it was, it was great. In there you can somewhere. maybe cut out the rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think there's a lot of value in there, and I think a lot of people will find that really, really helpful. So, thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Nice one. Thanks, mate. Cheers. All right, so I hope you guys found that useful. I think Charlie and Jess shared a lot of really valuable advice. And I hope you kind of take that on board and start to think about your why. Like, I'm definitely going to go away and reflect a bit more about why it is. I do what I do and why does I share what I share because I think having that message is so important having that thing that drives you so that on those days where you're really not feeling motivated or it's just not going your way you know deep down that like you're doing the right thing and it's following your it's following your core belief and the reason you started this business in the first place but yeah that's going to do it for today I hope you found that useful and um, thank you very much and I'll see you on the next episode <laughs>